are Stephen Dorrell, the chair of the NHS Confederation and a former Conservative Health Secretary, and Mark Littlewood, the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs. Hello to you both. Thanks for being with us. Stephen Dorrell, it can sometimes feel as though the NHS is in a perpetual state of crisis. So is this time any different? I think it is. Uh, the, the position is tighter. The uh, NHS is under huge pressure. I think the government is, I, I applaud the government for putting some money into social care because that will relieve some of the pressures in some parts of the health service. But the core truth here is that demand for health and care services looking across the sector as a whole, demand for health and care services is rising here and in every other country in the world. There's only two, way, two things. Either we provide additional funding or we increase efficiency, or more likely in the real world, both. Because one, in a civilized society, what we can't do is say there is demand for health and care services, but we can't meet it. Do you agree with that assessment, that there's two things that should happen? Yeah, my worry is that too often the argument seems to rely on we've got to throw more money at it. Now, obviously, if you throw more money at anything, you tend to improve it, whether it's health care or anything else. The more money will get you a certain way. But I think we've got to think much, much more radically. You said at the outset, Sophie, it seems to be a crisis every year. I mean, I think the NHS has been in crisis or reported being in crisis every year of my adult life, whether it's junior doctor strikes or not enough beds or, or God knows what else. So I think we've got to think much more radically. Do we think it is just sort of one more heave and another effort to find efficiency savings and promising to increase spending by 3% rather than 2%? Or do we need to look across the English Channel and actually ask ourselves, are we sure the NHS is the envy of the world? Or are there some other European countries who are actually achieving better results so than we are? So are you mentioning the kind of forbidden word then, the privatisation word? Well, I don't think it needs to be privatised, but um, I, I think if you were to look to sort of Scandinavia, even France, hardly a hotbed of right-wing capitalism in the provision of services, they actually have, I think, a more market-orientated system, but they managed to still ensure the key thing that I think Brits want is universal coverage. Everyone must be covered. You can't have the bottom, you know, 20, 30 percent of society with no health care coverage. But most other European countries seem to manage that and don't seem to have this perpetual state of crisis that what's, we have in Britain. What's your take on this, Stephen Doyle? Well, Do you think we are at risk of just throwing money at a problem? No, I don't think that. I think for, uh, two, two responses to what Mark has said. Uh, the first is that although it's true that we debate the, our health and care system at, on a Actually, that's true in all advanced countries, and indeed, in, it's, all, it's true right across the globe. Access to health care is something all people everywhere care about. And if you look at our health and care system, compare it with other systems elsewhere in Europe, actually, we deliver outcomes uh, marginally more efficiently. Uh, uh, the, these statistics are always difficult between different countries, but we, in truth, it's a smaller share of our economy than it is of most continental economies. So we don't do too badly in terms of efficiency. The other thing is that uh, every country has its own means of securing equitable access. I think you can spend hours arguing about how we might do it differently. The NHS is something the British are committed to. What we have to do is to make it an efficient, high value system. It doesn't do badly, but it could certainly do better. So what do we think then of the measures announced in the budget? We had £120 million for GPs to work in A&E, and we also had some money for social care. Was it anywhere near enough? Probably not, in truth. Uh, I've got some sympathy with where the Chancellor found himself here. I doubt it would ever be enough. I mean, certainly not within the envelope. Stephen's right. We do spend uh, a little less on health care as a proportion of GDP than other European countries. So this will make a difference of some sort. But it's not going to mean that the NHS or social care is never going to be in crisis again. This money will be gone through pretty quick. And again, I want to learn from European countries, because although they've got a state guarantee and guarantee access, Often that extra bit, that extra couple of points on GDP uh, that they spend there as a proportion of their economy compared to ours is actually allowing more private money into the system. That doesn't mean the poor need to pay up, but somebody on a decent middle-class salary might need to make a bit more private provision rather than just looking at what Philip Hammond announces he's going to give them in his budget each year. Because that really is the controversial issue, isn't it? Should people who are from wealthy backgrounds 
for their health care? Should the NHS always be free at the point of use? What, what's your take on that? My answer to that is that it's something politicians love to talk about, as though our health and care system was all tax-funded. That's actually not true. If you, the Office of National St Statistics did a genuine analysis of our health and care system compared with others on the continent. We have a, a, a wide range of different providers in the third sector, in the private sector, and in the public sector of health and care services. We have different uh, uh, revenue streams coming into health and care. We should look at health and care as a single sector rather than the NHS on its own. What we shouldn't do is engage in a political debate which is a kind of abstraction which avoids addressing the real issue which every Western country faces, which is demand is rising and you have to fund uh, the, the meeting of that demand on the basis of the structures that we have. And social care is clearly something that is in crisis as well. You have this kind of slightly hard-hearted sort of way of describing vulnerable elderly people as bed blocking. Mm. Do you think that the government's got a grip on how serious the issues are in social care? Oh, I think I, now everybody realises how serious it is. But this is probably going to be a problem that's going to take 20, 25 years to crack, OK? We haven't saved appropriately through whatever scheme, either a government scheme or private scheme, schemes or some mixture of the two for this problem. Now, that doesn't help you if you're 80 years old now and need social care. That's got to be provided. But I think we've got to take a much longer term view. I'm in my mid-40s. Uh, perhaps some new provision for people who are roughly my age needs to be put in place now for what I'm anticipated I might need when I'm in my 70s. So it requires an unbelievable long-term view. Yes, money is needed now to plug some gaps, but that shouldn't be our strategy year on year as each year unfolds and the bill goes radical rethink. And of course this is becoming a political problem as well, isn't it, for the Prime Minister. It seems that David Cameron almost managed to neutralise the issue of the NHS for the Conservatives. He, of course, relied very heavily on the NHS for the care of his uh, disabled son. Stephen Dorrell, do you feel that Theresa May needs to neutralise the NHS as a political issue? Well, I don't think you can ever take, and nor do I think you should try in a democracy to take health and care services out of politics. People say it's above politics. Actually, in every country in the world, People care about their access to high quality care. It is inherently political. That's not the same thing as saying we, that we should continue to be trapped into a sterile party argument about this, which is why on a cross-party basis I've argued for some time now, not that we should try and take it out of politics, but that we should engage on a cross-party basis in a more adult uh, discussion about how we fund growing demand for health and care services properly. And it does feel as though that grown-up conversation is desperately needed at the moment. Any signs, and miles away. Any signs um, of that happening? You, you no? can't, I mean, Stephen's right. It's, it, it, you can't depoliticise something that involves the government spending more than £100 billion pounds every year. I mean, it's a big part of government expenditure, and we have political parties running our government. But I hope we can actually have a more mature discussion in the weeks and months to come, rather than what actually often just feels like a slanging match between politicians of different quick, stripes. Quick, quick point from People you. often think that it's because it's tax-funded that it's political. That's not the case at all. In any society, it's access that's political, and the question is how you ensure that people who need access to care get it. Okay, Stephen Dorrell, Mark Littlewood, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. An Australian man who obtained explicit images from children by